Our Old Testament reading uh, for this evening is coming from Deuteronomy chapter 24. So if you um, have your copy of the Bible, open it to Deuteronomy chapter 24. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 4. Hear the word of the Lord. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, when she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you should not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. And our New Testament reading are two of them. Matthew chapter 19. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 10 of Matthew chapter 19. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and healed him there. And he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. And if you would turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we'll be picking up in verses 10 going through 16. Now to the married I command you, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But I say to the, but, but to the rest, I, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know... For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for your word and that you have given us clear uh, descriptions of what marriage is, what it's to be, and even clear descriptions of divorce and when it is acceptable and unacceptable. I pray, Lord, that you'd fill me with the Spirit to help me Teach and preach faithfully your word. And that it would edify all those who are here. 
Not just those who are married. Not just those who have been through divorces. But everyone would be edified from your word. That it would not return unto you void. As you have promised to do. Father, it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, last week we looked at verses 1 through 9. And we saw two of the three principles of marriage there, or the purposes of marriage. And if you recall, the three principles or purposes of marriage, which have been quoted throughout history, especially at weddings, is a good place for it, are first, marriage was ordained by the triune God for the procreation of children. And that was not directly uh, stated within our text. But the following two were... Secondly, marriage was ordained for a remedy against sin to avoid fornication. And that's one of the divine purposes of marriage. And thirdly, marriage was ordained for the mutual society help and comfort that one ought to have of one another, both in prosperity and adversity. And this was alluded to in the passage concerning fasting and prayer. But there were other things that jumped out as well that we need to remember as we're going forward. As you may recall, Paul opened his words, his section by saying, Now concerning these things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And it's helpful to understand that that statement Paul quotes is a statement that is being used by the Corinthians. Even though many of them were duped by the sexual immorality of the man sleeping with his father's wife, others were not. They understood clearly that the man was in sin and there were problems of sexual immorality in the church. Therefore, they adopted the saying, it is good for a man not to touch a woman in all instances. As is the case, this group of believers were more sensitive to sin than others. But instead of dealing with the problem in a mature way, they started calling for abstinence for all. They saw, that sec- that sin, um, they saw that the sin of sexual intercourse was the problem, and so the solution to them was to ban all sex. And again, this is a really an adolescent response to the problems of sin and always avoids the real problem, the problem of the wicked heart. Paul wasn't agreeing with the statement at all, but quotes it because by saying it, he's showing the statement Uh, is true for those who are single, but for those who are married, and he deals with it, they're not to deprive their spouses of sexual intimacy, except for times of crisis when there is prayer. To deprive ones, and this is part of what we're looking at tonight, to deprive one's spouse of conjugal rights is to actually defraud the spouse of God's divine purpose in providing the proper outlet for the sex drive. Now, Dr. Bonson writes, Greg Bonson writes that, you know, more clearly that to deprive one's spouse of sexual intimacy is actually sexual infidelity, thereby breaking the marriage covenant and is grounds for divorce. I think that after we get through this, you'll see some of that, of what he's speaking of and what I think the text is also saying. Bonson goes on to write, Willful refusal of sexual relations with one's marriage partner is thus explicitly called defrauding or it is stealing his or her rights. And we saw that in 1 Corinthians 7 5. He goes on, he says, It is breaking of the contractual obligations of marriage. Paul's use of this kind of language is noteworthy for understanding the covenantal nature of the marriage bond as well as how it is dissolved. He is saying, and I am as well, that being unfaithful to our calling in marriage is a cause for divorce in this regards. Now, I know for some of us, this may come as a shock or a strain strain to us because of the fundamentalism that we grew up with, that in so many cases, it's stated that it's only for actual adultery that one can ever divorce. That would be within the body of Christ or or anybody. Um, On top of that, they go even further by by saying that remarriage of the one whose divorce is completely forbidden as long as the offending party has not remarried. So, you know, Bob is married to Jane. Bob cheats on Jane. 
he continues in an adulterous relationship. He's unrepentant. Jane has the freedom to v- divorce Bob. But according to certain sectors of evangelicalism, they say, Jane, you have to remain single. You can never remarry until it is certain that Bob doesn't repent and come back to you. The position cuts against the grain of the pr- principles of stating, stated above. The simple reality that you're still depriving sexual intimacy to Jane. So that cannot hold. As I hope to see the evening, this evening, the unbiblical divorce, we, we, there is unbiblical divorce, but we also see that there are times for biblical divorce and it is warranted. There are times when a Christian is not sinning when they divorce their spouse. And in doing so, they are free to remarry. Now to our text, verse 10. Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart. And that idea of departing there is to divide or put asunder from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. Now, if that's all that Paul said, the evangelicals who held that fundamentalist view would be absolutely correct. Okay? Um, What what Paul is dealing with right now is two believers. A Christian man and a Christian woman. And he's saying, look, they shall not depart. And if they do, they shouldn't, they shouldn't, uh, or they should remain single until there's reconciliation. That's the goal between a husband and wife who are Christians. So, and even when there's adultery involved, the goal is reconciliation, repentance and reconciliation. So what do we have to do with the rest of this? Well, we continue on and he goes, um, but to the rest... I, not the Lord, say if a brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. Okay. Later on in 2 Corinthians, he's going to talk about the fact that we're not to be unequally yoked. And we can draw from that the, the principle that as believers, we are not to marry unbelievers. But in this situation, there were, there were cases in which men and women were coming to know the Lord and their spouses were not. That was, that was happening in Corinth, and it happens in, in our day as well. And he's saying, look, I, not the Lord, say it. Um, by the way, that doesn't mean it's any less authoritative. He's still an apostle. But what he's saying is that, the, that, that Jesus didn't say this specifically. Okay? He says, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. So there's that situation where one is a believer and one's not. They're not to divorce if the unbeliever is willing to stay. Okay. Now, the question came up, well, if you're living with an unbeliever, aren't you tainted by sin? Aren't you defiled by that? And aren't the children? Well, he comes right out and says, no, that's not the case. Verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Okay? So what he's saying is that it's all right for this to happen. It's all right for this to remain this way. There's no uncleanness imputed to the one who's saved or to the children because of the unbeliever. And then in verse 15, he goes on and says, But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Okay, Here he's giving the believer the freedom to divorce if the unbeliever departs. Because he is in a sense, he's he's not submitting to the dictates of marriage. He's not submitting to that which he's called to do. He is depriving his wife or his, you know, she's depriving... Uh, her husband, the one who departs of the conjugal relationships, and therefore he is he is breaking the the, the, co- the uh, he is breaking the covenant of marriage. So the believer in that situation does have the right to divorce. Now let's back up a little bit. It's earlier it said now to 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 the married I command yet not I, 
I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. We're backing up a little bit because we're going to go in a different direction now. I just wanted to go over a basics of the text so you had an idea of what the whole thing meant. But I think there's a, a larger picture of what's going on. Paul's first point is that the wife is not to depart from the husband. She is not to divide or put asunder that which God has put together. But he goes on to say, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And the husband is not to divorce his wife. Now, like I said, if we were to stop in this verse alone and, and not go any further, those in, uh, in evangelical circles calling for that abstinence and remaining single and all of that would be correct. But the condition here that Paul is referring to is for those who are dis, displeased with their, their spouse. It isn't for any reason that we know of that is biblical that they're seeking a divorce. You cannot divorce for any reason at all. According to Christ. Now, Paul is not out of accord with Christ. In fact, he refers to what Christ is saying as his authority. Paul is appealing to the Lord for his authority. And both Matthew 19 and Mark 10, uh, in that those two passages, the Lord speaks about divorce and the reasons for divorce. And so Paul is referring to that when he says, yet not I, but the Lord. He didn't, like I said, he didn't have to appeal to the Lord for special authority. He had it, but he does appeal to the Lord. Now, it's at this point that we need to go to Matthew 19 in order to understand what Christ has said and to help us understand about the covenant of marriage itself. So in your Bibles, if you've got them, turn them up, turn over to Matthew chapter 19. If we... One more step back. We need to understand the basics of marriage itself and the fact that it is a covenant. If we don't understand that marriage is a covenant, it's all going to be moved. There are so many people who think marriage is just a a legal contract. It's an agreement. It's it's, it's, we're living together and we just want the benefits of of, from the government. We, We think it's a piece of paper from the government that makes a marriage a marriage and we all know that a piece of paper doesn't make a marriage a marriage now, do we? <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. But anyway, so what is a covenant? It, a, 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 it is a covenant. So what is a covenant? Let's back up there a little bit more. It's an agreement between two parties, oftentimes between a greater, greater and lesser entity, whereby the greater offers protection, provision, and fellowship to the lesser. And the lesser offers obedience, loyalty, and service to the greater. A covenant is oftentimes signed with an oath, oftentimes through the shedding of blood. Most of you can think of probably Abraham. And back in Genesis 15, when he was still Abram, God made a covenant with him by dividing up bulls, by by dividing up heifers, by dividing up a a three-year-old ram and and turtle doves and a female goat and all of that and laid them aside. And that was going to be the sign of the covenant. All right. And so the two were to walk through. If you had a covenant, you'd lay this animal aside. You'd take your arms. You'd wrap the arm uh, uh, wrapping around your two arms and you'd walk between the two animals. And the idea was that whoever breaks this covenant May this happen to whoever does that. So when the covenant was broken, you know, it uh, it was meant death to the one who broke it. Now, fortunately, in Genesis 15, for Abraham, he was asleep. Fortunately for us. Because it wasn't God and Abraham who walked between those animals. It was God and God. The first person and the second person of the Trinity walked in. And the second person of the Trinity who has walked between the two pieces, he ratified it, he fulfilled it, he even pays the debt to those who broke it. That's the gospel in Genesis. So we see that shedding of blood. Okay? And we also know that the sign of the covenant in the Old Testament was what? It was circumcision. Again, the shedding of blood is made there to help us realize that this is a covenant that we have with God. 
But breaking covenants in general, Bonson writes, one party is not released from the obligations of the covenantal commitment unless the second party has violated the mutual contract by acting contrary to its terms. So we ask, is marriage a covenant? Yes, it is. Marriage reflects the greater spiritual reality that we have with Christ. This is why Paul writes what he does in Ephesians 5. Christ is the head of the church, the husband of the bride. Now, where was there shed blood in the covenant that we have with Christ? Oh, wait. Was there shed blood in that covenant? Yes, of course, on the cross. But is there shed blood in marriage? This is a key point that we miss. There should be. This is why keeping our daughters as virgins is so important. In the haze of the sexual revolution, we have lost that understanding that even on the wedding night, there's the shedding of blood for that covenant. Biblical support for marriage as a covenant is also found in Malachi 2.14. Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. God's telling them, you've broken this covenant. Marriage is a covenant. Now, what are the stipulations for breaking that covenant? Simply put, one party breaks it either by pornea, or desertion. Let's go back to Matthew now. They ask the question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? They were asking this because the sin in the Jewish community had become so great that they truly believed one could be divorced for any reason. They were not much different than we are today. Except that in our case, the state has decreed that one may divorce for any reason under the unbiblical notion of no-fault divorce laws. How does Jesus answer the question? He comes back and makes his appeal to the creation narrative. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? He appeals to the simple fact that the, the, there are two sexes, male and female. It's not open for discussion. It's a simple reality of life and that God made him this way. And Christ continues on. He says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. There we're beginning to see the stipulations of the covenant. First, we see that the man leaves his father and mother. That's a stipulation of the marriage. Okay, then we see that um, he he is joined to his wife. And and third, we see the two become one flesh. So the woman is half of the man and the man is half of the woman in this thing called the image of God between man and woman who are one flesh. Those are the three things that must happen for marriage to take place. And Jesus continues, he says, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Now, it's worth noting again that Christ is pointing back to the creation ordinances in answering the question. This means that this creation ordinance applies to everyone, not just believers. God in his grace also joins together those who are not believers as well as those who are. Therefore, the restrictions against divorce apply to non-believers as well as believers. What restrictions are given? Well, after the Pharisees had asked why did Moses permit divorce, and he did in Deuteronomy 24, Jesus answers and says to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Jesus, in quoting that or in saying that, in in his divine authoritative commentary on Deuteronomy, is is telling them that that the divorce law that was given there was because of their failure and their hardness, not because of God's grace or kindness towards them. It's more of a statement of of the Jews than it was on anything on God. So this was not a blessing to them, but a condemnation of them. As we read... Back in Deuteronomy 24, we fought, found that first the man marries, he finds no favor with his wife, and he sends her out, again, showing the coldness of his own heart. Because in those days, the woman ran the risk of becoming destitute in such a situation. 
She couldn't go out and get a job. So he decides he doesn't like her, sends her on her way. Second, the woman departs and she remarries. She's fortunate. She remarries. Third, the thing that happened was the second man detests her or dies. Fourth, the first man is prevented from remarrying her since this would defile the land. Again, the purpose of the law was, that was given was to recognize their cold hearts. Okay? And cold indeed for the treat a woman in such a manner was shameful. So Jesus is responding and showing that. Now here's something about that law. With one simple phrase, Jesus negates that law. He puts it in its context. But from the beginning, it was not so. This is not what Yahweh's ideal for marriage was to be. It was not what Christ wanted for mankind. However, he does give a stipulation for divorce. Now why? Why does he do that? I believe because marriage is a covenant. And it reflects the greater covenant that we have with God and that God's people have with Christ. We cannot let that pass from our understanding. The relationship between husband and wife points to the relationship between the church and Christ. To break the marriage covenant is to remind us of the times God, God's people broke the covenant with him. Okay? Their behavior was such that he actually issued them a certificate of divorce in Jeremiah chapter 3. That I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Ju- Judah did not fear, her, did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. And there were times when in a marriage a certificate of divorce may be issued. Okay. Jesus admits that. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, some of your translations might say fornication, but it's the Greek word porneia, as we've looked at before, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her, who is divorced, commits adultery. Like I said, we've come across this word porneia a lot when it comes to sexual immorality. If you recall, this means all kinds of sexual immorality. So it's not just adultery. It it can be fornication. It can be bestiality. It can mean homosexuality. It can be lesbianism. It can be incest or sexual relations with a divorced man or woman. Sexual immorality or fornication, as some translations say, is broader than just adultery. It goes beyond that. It refers to all kinds of sexual sins, as Bonson has pointed out. And it doesn't have to include sexual intercourse for it to be considered for divorce. Bonson writes, to give us a situation that would help us understand that, he writes, imagine a wife who engages in romantic kissing, undressing, caressing, fondling, mutual masturbation, or oral sex with someone not her husband. It would be ridiculous to defend her gain against the charge of fornication by appealing to the absence of genital intercourse. The Song of Song presents the, this kind of activity mentioned here as appropriate to the state of marriage, but there's no defense for someone who does that apart from their, part, their spouse in marriage. He goes on and shows that further, Bonson does that, that pornea has a broader concept to show that it means moral rebellion, unfaithfulness, arrogance, disbelieving God, depart, departing from God's standard of righteousness. It's a synecdoche for all the sins uh, of, of wicked Israel all combined to one. A synecdoche means the, uh, this, this part for the whole, that they use it there. and um, that, That's the way it was used in Ezekiel and Hosea. Paul lumps pornea together with other sins to show the general immoral conduct. But fornication and all uncleanness are covetousness. Covetousness, let it not even be named among you as fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. The point is, is that pornea need not connotate sexual intercourse for it to be used in divorce but we still have to be careful about how it is used. Bonson points this out, but if if the unbeliever, back in our our passage, he uses 1 Corinthians 7, 
But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. On the, on the authority of Christ, we may recognize only one just ground for divorce, namely pornea. Therefore, unless Paul is pitted against Christ, the Pauline permission for divorce for desertion must imply that desertion is a form of what? Pornea, fornication, and God's evaluation, regardless of any accompanying issue of illicit, illicit sexual intercourse. It involved, desertion involves depriving a spouse of what, they, what belongs to them. It's stealing from them. So desertion is a cause for divorce. We would hope and pray that if the marriage is made up of two believers, that there would be repentance and forgiveness when pornea is confronted. But even then, when one sues for divorce, given that repentance has occurred, if one still leaves, it is still in accord with Christ and Paul's words because that one is proving themselves to be an unbeliever. They're acting as an unbeliever by filing for divorce or by leaving. Back in Corinthians. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Now I pray that none of us ever face the prospect of divorce. I know that there are those of us here who have. And it's never good. But we must remember that divorce is not the unforgivable sin as it has been also presented in evangelicalism. You know, some of the things that I have heard said to me just because I went through a divorce as well and I don't want to go too deep into that. I would almost think I was no longer a Christian because of that. Some of the things that were said to me and some of the things that have been said to those who go through divorce. But there truly are innocent parties, and we're seeing that. That if one departs, and they refuse to repent, and they refuse to be reconciled, then the believer has the right to divorce. If one continues in pornea, and even, as some have shown, pornography, if a man continues in pornography, that's continual adultery. That's robbing the wife of what she deserves. That is grounds for divorce. Is anything grounds for divorce? Absolutely not. But God is gracious and kind and shows us that there are times when someone will not repent and there, will, there is a need for divorce. Otherwise, we can conclude with what Paul says in verse 15. But God has called us to peace. And I think by that he means we should always seek re reconciliation. So is divorce a reality in the church? Absolutely. Should we always work towards against it? Yes, we should. But we must recognize that there are times when it must take place. God has permitted it. He still hates it, but there is a time for it. And we must accept it. I pray that none of us here ever have to go through that. And that we're willing to submit to the word of God and repent and do what's necessary to keep our marriages strong. Let us pray. Father, we know that this is a tough, tough subject. And I pray, Lord, that you help, that you would use it for your glory in our lives. Strengthen us as a body, protect our marriages, protect the men, guard their hearts and their eyes, and the women, guard their hearts and their eyes. And let us be faithful as you are faithful. Pour out your grace in our marriages and in our lives. Where we are single, I pray, Lord, that you would help us glorify you as well in our thought lives and thought lives and patterns of living. That we would serve you faithfully. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.